Today we have another live video for you, um, and this time we are actually kind of behind the scenes in our digital initiatives unit. Um, I'm going to ask Carmen Beecroft, who is a digital projects librarian, to um, tell us a little bit about where we are, and hopefully we'll get a little chance to see around. Like, so what happens in this yeah. space? Yeah, um, so this is the DI studio. Usually the lights are off. Um, because we're doing um, a lot of color work, um, we have some professional image processing monitors, um, and so this is where a digital conversion happens. We've got um, three flatbed scanners. Um, we also have a digital camera stand um, here for photographing items from above, um, and a couple of soft boxes that will provide uh, diffuse light from either side and can be moved around. Um, so currently, we are scanning um, the Irma Voigt autobiography. <laughs> and a scrapbook um, of OU's first professional baseball player. Wow. So what we're here today to talk about is a project um, that we've been diligently, that our student workers have been <laughs> diligently scanning for months. Um, it's a, going to be about a thousand Civil War era letters and diaries, mostly letters. And um, we want to go into a bit more depth um, as to how these were created and how they were used um, during that time period. And so you said there's a lot of students who work here in yes. this department. Yeah. So how many how many different students do you know? Currently, oh. there's five. Um, we go up to about nine during the school year. We have fewer students working longer hours over the summer. And the, so they're doing scanning and kind of image manipulation, but not ma manipulation, but like image mm -hmm. correction. And then they're also working with the metadata, right? Yes. To make it so that yes. People can so find the metadata them. is the description um, <laughs> for the images, and they're doing. Uh, primary source research in order to find out um, what exactly is being depicted in these images. They're also describing them in a manner that would allow them to be represented in a number of different settings without necessarily the context of our digital collections. And so there's a lot of thought and um, professional standards that go into that. Sounds like a fun job. <laughs> I, hope, I hope the students find it fun. Um, okay, so tomorrow at 3 o'clock on the fourth yes. floor of the library, there's going to be an event um, as part of our Authors at Alden series. Um, but instead of having an author of a book, you're going to talk about the authors of the letters. Um, so could you just tell us a little bit about, uh, well, I should say that Stacey Lavender, our um, special collections librarian, is here as well and going to, uh, she's also part of this event. So if you could just tell us about what is happening at the event tomorrow um, and then maybe talk some more about what um, documents you have here. Uh, sure, yeah. So tomorrow we're going to be talking kind of broadly about letter writing in the 19th century. And so we're going to be using some letters from different collections throughout uh, that period um, and talking about the mechanics of letter writing, um, who was writing letters and why. Um, and then we're going to have the people there um, write letters of their own in the fashion of the time period. So we'll have fountain pens and we'll show them oh, how to fun. fold the paper up and turn it over and make its own envelope out of the paper and that sort of thing. So we're hoping it'll be really fun, really interactive. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're also going to, um, the Special Collections Librarian for Rare Books will also yes. be there with a selection of letter writing manuals of the time period. So basically form letters of if you wanted to write a love letter to your sweetheart but didn't know where to start, this would set it all <laughs> out for you. If you wanted to write a business letter, if you wanted to write to people across various different social stations, mm -hmm. um, they were very conscious of strata and modes of address in that time period. So um, how to physically write using a fountain pen with this continuous flow of ink, which was very different from the, uh, the, the dip um, model of, of writing with a, with a quill pen. Um, so that was something that people needed to learn how to do. Um, there were um, a lot of changes happening in this time period. People were going from making their own ink at home to buying ink, to buying paper. The paper itself was changing from um, from linen rag stock um, to wood pulp paper. So it's, it's a very different toothiness, a different feel of the paper. Um, and so people were pretty very uncertain of how to deal with this. At the same time, they're sending literally billions of letters a year. Oh my gosh. It's four billion letters um, in 1890. In 1847, I think it was like 127 million. And as that rise happens, you also see uh, an exponential explosion in the number of post offices. And there'll be people employed by the Postal Service. And it, it and the price drops precipitously. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's just a point. It's a huge change um, facilitated by um, 
increasing education, um, wealth, and people leaving, people moving away, people spreading out across the country um, in search of new opportunities. Sounds amazing. Did you have to do a lot of research? Yes. Like, did you know a lot about this topic before? <laughs> no. Or? Okay. Um, so. Actually, when um, when I found out that statistic about how many letters are being sent every year, I called Stacy and I said, "Does this sound right?" We were both <laughs> really shocked. Sure. I, I yeah. it does Correct. sound wrong, like, but I it is uh, <laughs> the USPS um, historian, the 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 government archivist for the Postal Service um, put out these figures six months ago. So I'm pretty wow. sure they're so correct. If anybody yeah. would know. Yeah. It would be the, it would be the post office, yeah. yeah. Oh, my gosh. Um, so could you tell us about the documents? You have a couple of the things here. Could we um, see them as best we can with the, the <laughs> camera here? <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> Don't everybody jump so in at first we've got um, one of the older letters um, that was scanned at the beginning of this project. Um, and as you can see, it was um, initially one piece of paper that was folded up to make its own envelope. And you might be able to still see um, the remnants of the wax, the sealing wax that was used. Wow. And this is because at this time period, um, a letter was one piece of paper. If you tried to send two pieces of paper, it was called a double letter, and you got charged double. If you tried to send it in an envelope, that was called a wrapped letter, and it was still two pieces of paper, so you got charged double again. Was it by weight? Because it weighed oh, more? Eventually, it became um, weight-based. Okay. At this point, it was paper, sheets of paper-based okay. was the pricing system. Wow. So eventually, um, you got to a point where if your letter weighed less than half an ounce, it didn't matter how many pieces of paper it was, so that led to thinner and thinner paper being used. So that stuff is actually more fragile and less likely to survive. Um, oh, in addition, okay. it's also wood pulp, which is more acidic and degrades quicker. <laughs> okay. But so um, we go from this model um, to by the time you get into the Civil War um, in the first. And well, this one was 1845, yes. right? Okay. Yeah. Sure. And so you get into, this is 1862. Um, and the Union has money to burn, and they think they're going to be home by Christmas. And so they start sending out this, um, this propaganda, basically, on the letterhead um, for people, for soldiers at the front to send home to their family. And you, you bought these. You didn't get these for free, necessarily. But um, they were subsidized. And so um, there's some really, um, perhaps shockingly um, stringent wording of death to traitors um, and this is um, you see a woman in a um, an American flag dress tending to a soldier um, in this one you see the tree of liberty um, and it has all of the uh, abbreviations of the states of the union and a little poem and it says traitors spare that tree touch not a single bough in youth it sheltered me and I'll protect it now um, and that didn't last very long. Like the, they stopped having the money to print these and send them out by the thousands. Um, and then, oh, we get a bonus. There's another one in here. Um, and oh, here wow. we have the uh, the great naval battle between um, the Ericsson's oh Monitor and the Merrimack. So these were the first submarines. Um, There's so much going on in yeah. just these three documents. Like you've got history, naval history, and paper history and kind of social history, it must be a really good source for research. Yes, yes, yeah. definitely. Um, yeah, our Civil War collections in particular, I mean, it covers uh, a lot of the different battles from a lot of different perspectives. We have soldiers of a wide variety of ranks um, included. We have uh, field surgeons, people doing medical work during the war, and then we also have everyone back at home talking about their family life mm -hmm. and sicknesses and, you know, frontier life in Ohio during that time period. So it's a really rich collection, covers a lot of different uh, topic. So yeah, I would love to see a lot of people yeah. doing research with these. And um, so the, the collection itself is, isn't live yet. We're getting up um, on that point. Yeah, that's an important point. <laughs> um, but um, once it is live, it will be, it's fully transcribed. So it's 350,000 words. Wow. Um, and it, you, it's, um, it's ripe for a lot of different applications. Um, I've done some textual analysis myself, and you can really see the differences um, in the, the writing style of individuals, like how many words they put in a sentence, how many unique words they're using, whether they're using more emotional language, whether you, they're using more clinical language, whether they're talking about their relationships or talking about their own feelings. Um, it, and it's, it you know, changes throughout time, because this goes from 1839 to 1866. So wow. you, this particular collection, there's, there's several others. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but so you see that, um, that change um, as well as people's horizons are expanding. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so do you have any idea of how we came to have these collections? Or is that that's um, always a tricky question, it seems like. <laughs> yeah, so there are about 16 different collections that are going to ultimately um, be in our Civil War Correspondent Collection online. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a wide variety of donors that brought us these letters. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it just depends from case to case. And off okay. the top of my head, I can't remember. But a lot of time, it's just people that have these, collect these collections of letters that have been passed down. Okay, through like their individuals. Families. Yes, yeah. and they come to the library and, and donate. Um, uh, records, but for specific collections, I'm not going to Okay, uh, yeah, yeah, I know, it's, it's com uh, complicated. Um, and so we've, in the past, we've talked about kind of how these things are preserved. Is there anything special with like a letter um, that you would do to keep it safe and, and available for future research? I mean, for the most part, for the moment, um, by and large, these Civil War letters are in pretty good shape. So we have them in folders. Um, some of the collections, it's, you know, one uh, letter per folder. Some of the collections, it's like monthly batches of letters in a folder. Um, and then we just keep them in our secure stacks that are um, climate controlled. Um, so, I mean, keeping them dry, keeping them uh, cool is the best line of defense. But other than that, we're not doing anything particularly involved preservation-wise with these. Okay. Um, oh, one other thing. You had said that, um, and you'll, I imagine you'll talk about this tomorrow, the kind of lengths people would go to to conserve paper because it did yeah. cost more to send another piece of paper. Could you, um, like I said, I know you'll talk more about mm -hmm. this tomorrow, but could you talk about a few of the things someone might have done to conserve paper at this time? So something that we see a lot in this collection is cross-writing, mm -hmm. especially um, in the earlier times when it was by page instead of by weight. Um, so you would write... Um, like you would normally write horizontally mm -hmm. and then you would turn your paper around and write vertically over what you've already written and I've seen even examples where they'll go over a third time on an angle oh um, and so yeah you're trying to parse out um, multiple layers of text over each other um, wow. or you'll you get to the end of your letter you run out of space you go all the yeah. way around the outside and then you get to back to the first page and turn it upside down and write in the little gap before you need know, wow. my dear mom and dad and it's um, it's it can be pretty intense <laughs> to try yeah. and read them. And so those are all, you're working on transcribing those, even those? They've are, actually yeah, already been they're transcribed. They're already done. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Which is really great. So is um, that, was a student, students work on that? I think it's actually. Um, I think some were student workers. I think some were the previ previous uh, person in my okay. position, the special collections librarian for the manuscripts collections. Okay. Um, yeah, I think he did a lot of work transcribing these, which yes, is really it must great. Have been difficult to get yeah. it all when it's so comp complex and yeah. they're very difficult to read even for like someone who looks at these kind of letters all day so yeah I mean I think for the average researcher it'll be really helpful to have them and so transcribes mean so you were talking about analysis you can look at like how many words people are using and so they're searchable so if someone's yes. interested yes. in a, a battle or a place yes. or a family someone could search through the collection mm -hmm. yes. and that. we're also um, putting in um, standardized place names into okay, every great. letter field or every letter's record, um, so that you will be able to see where people were writing from, especially um, the the people who were serving as they moved around the com around the country. Um, so actually, um, I don't know how much time we have, but I have a very <laughs> affecting little vignette. Um, I so Stacy initially um, processed this, you know, did a lot of um, work with this collection um, when she first started here, and she was telling me all about it. And I knew that one of the um, the sons died um, of the of the the woman who kept these letters, and I deliberately didn't look up when. I just knew where. And as I'm processing um, on my end, going through it, and as I'm putting in these terms that get closer and closer to the place where he died, I'm feeling oh, like more no. and more anxious. Yeah. And then I finally get to that letter, and it feels like like as I'm reading it, you know, it's 154 years ago. He he died a long time ago, and he's also dying right now. And um, so um, he had smallpox, um, and his commanding officer wrote to his mom and said he's going to get better, it's going to be fine. A month goes by, and then um, one of his compatriots um, writes to his mom and said he's dead. It was agonizing. I don't know why he felt the need to <laughs> yeah. go into that detail. Yeah, he's been buried in an unmarked grave, and this is the blanket we wrapped him in. And there is a grave marker for him in Louisiana, um, but I... I don't think that he was ever moved from that unmarked grave. Um, and so that, that month in between of just like waiting for them to figure mm -hmm. it out, it was just this um, level of engagement and immediacy that I don't think you would necessarily find with a secondary source. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow, it's really like people's lives, yeah. even though they've, you know, it's a long time ago. Wow. Right. Um, one last question. Um, sorry, I keep like, thinking of more. So, like, are there mostly people who lived around here? Like, mm -hmm. are there like, yeah, local there, yep. families? Yeah, it's, Athens. It's, oh, yeah, Athens County specifically. Okay. Yeah. Um, the Browns um, lived in Lee Township in Athens County. Okay. Um, then the the ones who made it big lived in Athens proper. Um, they were. <laughs> 
connected to the Athens Messenger. They owned it for a while, um, and a couple of them went on to be like state representatives and yes. elected officials. Um, anything else we should know for tomorrow? Um, no, just come ready, <laughs> ready to write. Okay, and so that's three o'clock tomorrow on the fourth floor. Everyone is welcome if you're here in Athens. Um, I'm sure we'll grab some pictures from the event to post to Facebook and Instagram as well. Um, as always, if you have any more questions, just leave them in the comments and I will send them on to the knowledgeable people to answer your questions. And um, thanks for following us live and we hope to see you tomorrow.